Hello and welcome to this edition of Off the Shelf, a product from the Conference Board. My name's Anne Stevens. I'm a conference director here at the Conference Board, working with global women business leaders, European HR executives and global CHROs. Today I'm more than delighted to welcome Dr. Max McEwen, who I've known for many years actually, and yet never had the privilege of working with until now. I'm especially pleased to introduce Max to our Conference Board communities across the world. So Max is a globally recognised innovation expert, an author of numerous books on strategy, innovation and adaptability. He's a strategist, a psychologist, he has four degrees, no less, including a degree in computing, a PhD in strategy and innovation, an MBA and an MSc in psychology. He's a strategic advisor to global organisations across a myriad of industries and I'm really excited he's here to talk to us today about not just one but two new books the 10th anniversary edition of the strategy book and the innovators book rules for rebels mavericks and innovators max welcome delighted to have you here today it's lovely to be here and looking out at the atomium that, that amazing sculpture i, I mean the, what a wonderful view and uh, lovely to be here with you on your podcast So, Max, thank you. So, look, let's let's look at this book. I mean, I have to say, it's a pretty funky, cool book. The Innovators Book, Rules for Rebels, Mavericks and Innovators. Uh, pretty unusual, I think. Nothing like anything I've seen before in terms of an innovation book. It's not a tomb. It's a very concise book. It's a beautiful blue colour, which I love. Um, I mean, the style and the images you're using and, and the conciseness of the book is really quite unique. Um, and I'm just wondering, actually, how much, you know, how you managed to get so much content into such a small book. In fact, you actually quote, don't you? This book is as short as possible. Rules for rebels, rule makers and rule breakers to help you pack light and travel far. Love to hear your well, views on really, that, Max. It, it, yeah, d as you said, so it's fairly small. It's a bit like the, the Paul Arden size books uh, or a penguin book. It's got a card cover. It has a placeholder. It has a little bit like a moleskin notes book. It has a little elastic spot and it's full of every principle that is illustrated inside is illustrated by a photo of a real world object. Some of those are works of art uh, juxtaposed with the principle and some of them are actually toy sculptures that I created and took the photos and really loved bringing them to life. So, so it's unique and it's for a reason, both because I enjoyed it. I wanted it to feel like creativity and innovation rather than just being about creativity and innovation. And I also wanted people to remember so that, that it's very effective for learning and motivation and very effective for recall and application. People are so busy, you have to be able to recall an image and then a principle and then put it to work in the real world rather than having t taken lots of notes and only got one idea from a big book, which often happens that you can't remember when you need it. Well, so this really is it, yeah, a handbook for memory and application. Yeah, and handbook, I think, is a great description. It's very unique and very, very, uh, very innovative, but also very attractive, very attractive. And I imagine would make a good present, actually. For those of you who haven't seen it, who are listening, I recommend you have a look at it. It really is quite attractive. But look, Matt, the let's... Gift of... Sorry, go on. I, I was just going to say the gift of creativity came to mind which was a bit cheesy, but it was, I think you really rightly say, it was really designed to be shareable as well. So approachable for the individual. It's in your bag, it's on your desk. You want to pick it up rather than it being just another thing you think you should do, but you don't do. But also really designed to be shared. But what, what I found was that a lot of leaders could be very enthusiastic about innovation or innovation culture, but still they have to share it with their team a senior team of colleagues who may not be equally enthusiastic or a less senior team of colleagues throughout the business who may be too busy or not as interested. And this is a way of ensuring, as, as we tend to say, that everybody's on the same page. Well, at least they're in the same book. Yeah, and then you good. can turn to a page and say, this is what we're focusing on today, this bit. And tomorrow, let's turn the page and deal with something else. Yeah, no, very good. I think you've definitely achieved that objective, no doubt. But look, let's get into the content, Max. I mean, you talk about in this book, the three jobs of an innovator. You talk about making new ideas useful, 
building a bigger brain and helping to win with new ideas. Uh, can you just share, you know, for the people who are listening, just share some of that thinking and some of your thoughts around those areas? Well, to, to, so you, you outlined them. I think it's useful to say that quite often innovation becomes quite, efforts to innovate become quite fragmented. So we all talk about silos and fragmentation throughout the business. We talk about the difference between strategy and execution or ideas and implementation. So they're, they're all divided out. And I think that's often because we deal with each of the elements of innovation in a fragmented way. A bit of creativity training, do a little brainstorm or a big brainstorm. Uh, and then that's separate from strategy and that's separate from culture or HR or motivation. So bring the three together, you have the idea that first ideas need to be nurtured and they need to be brought to life and, uh, and they need to be made useful. That's the first job. And then the second job is that kind of more cultural, motivational, organizational job of recruiting people to your cause recruiting people to your idea and building them around your idea to deliver variations on it, you know, again and again and again. Coke is about uh, uh, a cool branded drink on the move, but they have altered that idea and delivered it a million different ways over the years. Mm. So build a bigger brain. And then third, you've got to help your idea actually win in the world. It's, it's usually going to fail. You've got to help the idea of the business, the purpose of the business, your particular insight to succeed in the world. And that's all about strategy and competition. So you really need as an innovator, as opposed to just a creative person, to keep all those three jobs on the go if you are to make your innovation successful. And actually, you make it sound very easy and very simple. And what I like about this book is it actually breaks it down into very easy to digest sections. I mean, when I first got my copy of this book, I was very excited. I opened it up um, and I was intrigued to find a couple of small plastic babies enclosed with my book, which I was delighted about. And of course, now I've read the book, which, by the way, I read in less than two hours, I should add. You know, I'm not an avid day to day reader anymore, but this birth book is perfect for me and people like me because now I understand your hypothesis that actually new ideas are like babies and of course they have parents you know and you talk about necessity and curiosity I mean perhaps you'd just like to share with everybody who's listening you know your concept around ideas being babies I already lo love the, the way that 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 resonates so you can talk to me about the hypothesis and I think that's one of the virtues of having a short book and a, a, a well-structured book and then having those uh, ideas, those analogies, quite visual analogies that you can wrap your head around. So I do talk about how all ideas have two parents, necessity, you might need to do something, or curiosity, you just want to figure it out. You know, I was one of those kids who take apart TV sets and telephones and things, and I was just curious. And both of those come together really to bring an insight, an idea. And uh, yes, I describe an idea being as a baby, beautiful at that point of conception, as it were, or, or birth, whichever, because it has both creation points, a baby comes out into the world, beautiful to the person who creates it, often a little bit ugly to people who don't, they just see the squashed little baby head or something. We all, we all love our own babies, Max, it's just that we don't all have to like other people's. <laughs> You do. And it's funny, you know, that phrase about killing your baby. It's quite easy. In the corporate terms, we're happy to kill other peoples to give them a kicking or just ignore them to put them to one side. But the truth is that the best ideas that we come up with are often the most beautiful to us and also the most ugly to other people. And what we have to agree is definitely not finished yet. You know, when you're holding up that baby, I have four children, and as I held my babies, they're beautiful to me, but not finished yet. They need nurturing, nurturing from their parent, their parents, from their family, from, you know, the village, the community. And so it is with ideas that the person who comes up with that first insight needs a whole community ultimately to both develop their idea and to adopt it, or, you know, to put it into practice, to use it. So the person who just flicks the light switch is part of the electricity innovation. They didn't create it, they don't put it into practice, but at the point that they flick up that light, they're part of innovation. And I think that's what we 
we have to remember that innovation is all those who use the value that's in an idea, not just the person who first had that idea. That's really good and very helpful. And you've, you know, the interpretation uh, that you've given us and and in the book is absolutely excellent. Um, you've already mentioned the images in this book, and I have to say some of them are really amazing and very very interesting, and some are very impressive. But I was particularly captured by the one of the helmet, the painting with the brain inside the helmet, um, under a section which says, "What you know can hurt." And the way I've interpreted that is, is is basically a reference to unlearning what we already know and then being prepared to relearn. Um, and you know, and I love your you know the terms you're using like two furs, three furs. Um, can you perhaps share a little bit more about that in terms of you know how people should perceive that or how they should interpret it? Well, well, definitely as you described, and I love again that you responded to the image yourself. So when I'm when I'm teaching and I'm being visual. I, I, I love that people put themselves into that image without you even having to explain it. And then, of course, the person is motivated and bi- building a picture. So, so yes, the, in this case, as you describe, what we think we know or what we know uh, and worked in the past can definitely trap us. The person who says, you've heard the grumpy person who just says, I, I don't see what all the fuss is about. Yeah. X, yes. whatever X is this yes. year, I don't see what all the fuss is about. The I assume it became, you know, began with motor cars or writing, but now it's I don't understand what the fuss is about the internet or social media or it's not just social media. It's TikTok. I don't see how what, what's all this fuss about. You know, autonomous cars. It's just silly, and, and, and you can so easily think that you're knowledge is going to work in the future, that it has not been superseded, that it is correct just because you learnt it and passed an exam, or that it's brought you forward to this point. And really, knowledge shifts. What is popular shifts. You might be right, but the world might have moved on. My father often used to complain that the children wouldn't email him. Uh, He liked being emailed the news about his children. And I'd point out, yes, but Facebook does that for you or (laughs) Instagram does that for you. And they're not going to change just to suit you. And so it is with all knowledge. Knowledge moves on both subjectively uh, and objectively. And you have to move with it because ignorance or past knowledge won't protect you. Well, you've just conjured up a very funny image in my head, actually, of my 89-year-old mother getting onto Facebook, and I just can't see it happening somehow. It would be nice <laughs> if she would, but I don't think it's going to happen. But look, while we're talking about sort of visualisation and other ideas, I loved the idea of the, um, the, the zombies, the idea zombies. You know, and I think your phrase is, beware of idea zombies. And I thought it was a great analogy, actually, because, of course, this is something that's relevant at all levels of an organisation, you know, including senior, senior leaders, who I guess, you know, you could argue should be set the scene or the context and or the environment for innovation um, and in fact you pick this up again later in the book when you talk about leadership karma but could you just expand on the theory and particularly about idea zombies yes again you have to I love zombie movies because it happens and they've become ever more <laughs> popular uh, I, I think and you've got they they started off as lump, lumbering sort of zombies moving slowly and now in more recent movies they move very quickly you know, the, the Brad Pitt uh, film, and, and they run very fast, they're ferocious. But what they have all in common is that they're dead, but they don't really know it. Uh, and they c- consume everything in front of them to, to no benefit. And so, so it is with Idea Zombies, they can be a project that we keep putting money into, but it's not going anywhere. It can be a a belief like those beliefs that hurt you, that knowledge that hurts you. And we're still carrying on and protecting it. I mean, you've seen a lot of that that at the moment, that, that, that still people are protecting ideas that are not only outmoded, they've been proven to be ineffective. They just just don't work. All issues of equality, of gender, that people are still continuing to defend in visible and invisible ways. And yet we have to somehow identify them and say that the Internet is going to be important. This was in the old days, but, but automation is going to be important. Engagement of talent is important. We need to kill off 
the thinking behind those antiquated idea zombies. And that's why I talk about going for the head. Ensure they're dead. Uh, I mean both we have to get into the heads of people to, to show, to, in effect, allow them to uh, to take hold of the thinking, not just to be told what to do via values or job descriptions or projects, but actually help them think through how things have altered and how they need to alter as a response, how they need to adapt, and also go for the head, the head of the organization. Some of the people who are listening, we have to go for the, those people so that the, those new thoughts and ideas can cascade throughout the organization. Right. And that's really helpful. I mean, as I'm thinking about innovation, um, it, I mean, it means so many different things to different people. And I think, you know, every business I'm working with, I'm sure the same for you, every leader's talking about it. They want it. There are lots of theories about how an organization might create the right environment or the right culture for innovation. I'm sure you've heard and seen and seen all of that, too. But in your experience, what do you see as the biggest obstacles? I mean, what gets in the way and what should organizations be doing? At one level, and perhaps this is the three jobs that we were talking about, there can be some fundamental, uh, I was going to say fun, fundamental vagueness about the whole subject, <laughs> that because you don't have a clear definition, but for instance, mine is that uh, innovation is new ideas made useful, innovation is practical creativity, because people aren't quite clear what it is, it just appears on a PowerPoint somewhere as one of the pillars of our strategy this year. And it's left to people to, to try to figure out what they mean by that. And because they don't have a clear picture of moving from insight to innovate, to idea, to innovation, to improvement, to some kind of competitive position, they neither understand its life cycle nor its purpose. Because that's what I think a lot of people mean. They either pick up innovation as a fad, as a buzzword that they think they should be doing, mm -hmm. or they pick it up because what they want is some magic from it. What they mean is we would like to be in a better competitive position, or we would like to save money, right. or we would like to make more money or, or something. And so I, 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 in one way, that understanding, I mean, I point out to clients that encourage innovation and creativity and see where that comes from and and learn about the life cycle of a an idea baby through to becoming a you know an idea shark in the market but then also ask people in the business for innovation and ideas to solve a problem you value so, which is a different approach. Yeah, so, so I mean, I'm reading into that, that you see that much more as a sort of an integrated way of running a business rather than, as you've already mentioned, a standalone pillar um, as part of your strategy. So it has to be the way you do things, I guess. It has to be much more embedded in, in the way you operate as an organisation. Yes, it, it, and it also speaks to, to allowing, to, you're encouraging creativity generally and seeing what comes of that that was unplanned. So, you know, Steve Jobs does not invent the iPod. He does not invent the computer. He doesn't invent the mouse. He doesn't invent the, you know, the GUI screens. He doesn't invent any of that stuff. But because he is open to ideas, they come to him. And because he's seeking, he's asking questions, people also come to him with answers. So it's very much those two things at once. You might say to your group, I, I really need a way of pleasing customers in order that the people are more satisfied, in order that we be more successful in the market. That's a question, and then people can respond to that creatively. But you can also say, listen, we don't have all the answers. If somebody's got something that could really improve our position, please come to us and explain it to us, and we will support you. So you try both of those simultaneously, and as you say, do it in an integrated way. It's really about the flow of ideas through to performance. And that's why culture, structure uh, and process are all important here.
Yes, of course. Um, what about the audience for this book? I mean, I love I love the way that you mentioned pioneers, trendsetters, hipsters, hackers, hustlers, trailblazers, inventors, heretics, creators, problem solvers, optimists, obsessives, fire starters, scientists, risk takers, disruptors, game changers, explorers, garage heroes. And then people like you. I mean, let's t- let's just talk about that because I mean that's really I mean I love it. But I mean, let's just really think about the use of this book and what and what people can be using it for. Well, at, at the one stage as you you describe, it's it it is for everyone, and people see, tend to say that. Except that because human history is the history of ideas, uh, I would say that we are a creative animal. That's the thing we do. We do imagination. We do innovation, we do ideas, we do creativity, we do strategy. So because we are aware that of the past and we are aware that we can shape the future through our actions, we, we move towards these kind of disciplines. So at the one hand, anybody who would like to shape something better or to feel more creative, and we know about 75% of people feel that they're not living up to their creative potential. And only 14% of people know what the strategy is about in their company. So there are a lot of people who would benefit from the book. But but for your audience in particular, they can benefit as senior leaders because despite or because of its uh, quite uh, creative, visual, playful nature, they will be able to, as you were, to get through it in a couple of hours and then go back to it. And by going back to it, they will be able to apply it to their work to say, okay, what leadership style works here? What kind of culture do I need? Idea toxic? Idea hungry? Idea wasteful? Where where are we at the moment? How do I recruit people? How does that apply to innovation? Essentially, really deep research. Everything we know about innovation has been plugged into this but I've taken the time to make it as short as possible. So senior leaders can really benefit, use it for an away day, use it personally, but then you can start to share it with the rest of the organization, teams at all levels, so that, as I said that earlier and we discussed, you are on the same page and you can use it in team meetings, my clients do, so that even if they can't have me in person, each person each week is using a page for a team meeting and then they share ideas and they kind of cascade up and down uh, and you can have people using it individually to develop their own ideas so to, throughout the organization and I think in that also it's unique it certainly is and as I've mentioned to uh, to you and to the audience several times it's a very unusual book but also very very digestible really really helpful um, and I guess the question would be you know it's not just about this book is it you know you've written other books in fact you've got a recent book I understand on strategy but how can people get sort of optimum value and maximum learning from not just your books but also all your other power, uh, powerful ideas and actually you've got a pretty unique approach to the work you do with your clients I mean I think it would be useful if you could tell tell our listeners a little bit about that well the Einstein said creativity is intelligence having fun. And, uh, I, <laughs> well, fun's I, important, I, of course, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I have always loved that. And what I have sought over the years with, with my clients is a way of making big ideas uh, backed up by research di- into things that are digestible and enjoyable and uh, actionable. You know that, uh, so after a conference, I want somebody to go away enthused and enlightened and engaged, but also be able to put it to practice the next day and remember it in 10 years. So the the 10th anniversary edition of the strategy books out. And what's been fabulous there is people have actually been reading it. They've seen me in a conference, read the book and developed their career and gone from being a student to being in the, the, the senior leadership team or the CEO. So so in one way, that's the effectiveness I want from my work. But visually, that's developed so that I have a huge canvas behind me. If you imagine Picasso sort of painting Guernica, (laughs) a big canvas. Uh, And what I do there with with large, really giant marker pens is in a graffiti cartoon style, 
draw a picture that brings these ideas to life. So you really are traveling from one island to another island across the water. Those are strategic concepts, trying to get to paradise. And you have, I draw zombies and sharks and boats for people to travel in and rockets and illustrate those stories so that people in the audience, whether it's half an hour or it's two days, are bring themselves into that picture. They put themselves in that place and they travel with me. And so that that is unique. And when you're workshopping it, I mean, it works with a thousand people in the audience. But when you're workshopping it with smaller groups, the senior leadership team and others, you can actually add their ideas and their thoughts and their feelings into that and show them what everybody is thinking and nothing gets lost. So often in these sessions, things get lost every time you turn the flip chart or you click the PowerPoint clicker, you forget what has been said before and people then start to repeat themselves or feel isolated. But this visual approach is fun, but also integrative. It's holistic and therefore powerful. People take a photo of it. They feel that they've been part of something fabulous, but they also remember and put it into practice ahead of the t- next time that you meet. Yeah, it sounds like a very powerful, a very powerful way of, of helping people retain some of those conversations and some of the uh, discussions you're having while you're, while you're all together. Um, Max, listen, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I don't need to tell you how good it's been to have you with us. And this has been a really excellent conversation, I have to say. Um, I mean, I'm certain, you, you know, we will have created an appetite for even more insights and knowledge from you. I mean, how can people find out a bit more about you and learn more about your work? Well, I, I'm a lover of books, so definitely go to Amazon or Waterstones or, or, or wherever, Audible, and uh, buy the new books. Uh, that's a pretty good value, <laughs> max time, uh, from my experience. The strategy book and the innovators book definitely go together. But also pro- the YouTube, there's video of me speaking and drawing that you can share. And then come find me on LinkedIn, where we have quite a vibrant community of readers and fans of my work sharing things and asking questions, uh, seeing video and the latest work and the dates where I'll be speaking at open events uh, and people can inquire uh, about working with me more closely. Excellent. Thank you. So Dr. Max McEwen on LinkedIn. That sounds like a pretty straightforward uh, way for people to find you. So Max, it just just leaves for me to say thank you so much once again for making the time. It's been a great discussion. For those listening, I do recommend you look at the book. It's really fascinating. It's concise. It's handy. It's very clear. Um, And probably for me, in terms of innovation, the first book I've ever picked up and read, I digested and really understood. So it's really helped me tremendously. So Max, thank you so much. A complete delight, Anne, as ever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. So thank you, everybody, for joining this episode of Off the Shelf. If you've enjoyed it, please do sign up for the full series of our podcasts or even our broader podcast program, which you can find on our website, www.tcb.org forward slash podcasts. It just leaves me to say goodbye and thank you for joining. <laughs>